the attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941, and Germany's declaration of war on the United States shocked the nation. America was surprised, but thousands of young men and women were ready to answer the call. Kenneth McCutcheon was one of these men. Little did he know that on July 15, 1942, he would embark on a journey that would take him from his hometown of Evansville, Indiana, to the deserts of North Africa, the island of Sicily, and the villages of France and Germany. The war that was an ocean away had effects on Ken McCutcheon's hometown. For residents in Evansville, living with the rationing of gas, rubber, and foods became a daily routine. They were also reading about the new war factories that were starting construction, most notably the shipyards on the riverfront that would produce LSTs and Republic Aviation, which would produce P-47 Thunderbolts. For Ken McCutcheon, this war would soon take him from his home on the north side of town to distant lands. His journey would start on July 15, 1942, when he arrives at Fort Benjamin Harrison in northeast Indianapolis. During World War II, the U.S. troops were prohibited to keep diaries. However, Ken McCutcheon was in charge of burning all the records in his battalion if the German troops were to overrun them. Because Ken McCutcheon was tasked with this job, he was able to keep a war diary throughout his journey in the war. On July 15, 1942, Ken McCutcheon left Evansville for training. Off to the Army today on the noon train for Fort Benjamin Harrison. Had lunch at the Red Cross Canteen at the L&N Depot before leaving. At Vincennes, we picked up more draftees, and at Indianapolis, five carloads coming in from Ohio and points east. Ken McCutcheon had a rough first night adjusting to his new atmosphere. Didn't sleep a lot the first night in camp. Probably it was the big supper we ate at 9 p.m. having arrived after 8 at the barracks. The food is good and the portions extra large. This morning, we were issued complete clothing for both the summer and the winter. By the time Marines were fighting on Guadalcanal in the South Pacific, Ken had traveled to Fort Leonard Wood in Missouri for further training. While there, he had time to write some poetry and reflect on the events of the world. Lines while walking guard duty. Tonight I walk the lonely hill to and fro and watch the gleaming plants flow across the sea of sky. Tonight our world is dark. Men spill their brother's blood without just cause, and little children cry, and in their ruined cities cringe and dies. Those other worlds seem silent and afar. I wonder if they also hate and kill, and if upon some lonely hill a guard stands wondering at our star. While many American troops spent their first Christmas away from home, Ken McCutcheon found himself in Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, eating dinner in the cafe with close friends. On April 2, 1943, Ken McCutcheon found himself on a ship headed towards Africa. Left the pier at 6 a.m. It has been foggy and cloudy almost all day. There are a large number of ships in our convoy. I don't know exactly how many. We may have been followed by blimps and planes all day. Some of the boys are getting seasick. They say we'll be on board 12 to 16 days and are going to Africa. I saw a gorgeous sunset tonight. Just before it sank, the sun came out of the cloud big and round and red and disappeared in the ocean, leaving the waves in a dull red pink cap. As the war raged on, Ken McCutcheon sailed for North Africa. On April 13th, after a week at sea, Ken's ship, the Slatterdyke, reached port in Mir al-Kabir, Algeria. Sailed into the port at about 3 p.m. this afternoon. Mir al-Kabir, Algeria, as soon as we safely docked in the harbor. The chaplain read a psalm and offered a word of prayer for thanksgiving for a safe voyage, then played the Star-Spangled Banner. The harbor was very lovely, like a travelogue in technicolor. There are high mountains on the sides, and nestled inside them is a city, very white and clean-looking in the afternoon sun. High above the harbor on a ship pinnacle is an old fort and a Catholic mission built on the sheer rock. Around the bay there are numerous smaller settlements with pink and white stucco houses. The mountains were wondrously green with spring. It was a sight that I shall remember. McCutcheon found the land of Algeria beautiful. The scenes of this foreign land were intriguing to the Hoosier. It was as if he stepped into a storybook land with rolling hills, fields of vibrant flowers, and mountaintops surrounded with clouds. The Christmas, 1943, would be Ken's first, thousands of miles away from home. Christmas Day. Last year I was at home and didn't have any idea I would be spending my next one in Africa. Yesterday afternoon we took showers and shined our shoes. Supper was served for the first time in the new mess hall. 
After supper, there was a movie followed by a carol singing. Then I went to the AAC and sang some more with them and a group of British boys. At midnight, we went to Catholic Mass at the church in Jerryville. It is noon and we're going to have a big dinner. Just returned from partisan service at Red Cross Center, I sang Cantique de Noel. There were about 400 men present, American and English soldiers and sailors, and a few German prisoners. Ken was on the move again. On January 9th, Ken left African soil and headed to Corsica on a British LST. On January 12, 1944, Ken had the special opportunity to go to Napoleon's house in Ajaccio. He noted it as an interesting day. At noon, well-dressed high school students came on the streets with arms full of books on their way home for lunch, just like in any American city. On first entering a strange town, I usually wander aimlessly through the streets to get bearings and buy some postcards at the first shop I find. Brunman and I went together, and the first cards we saw were sold by a little old French lady in black, who at once told me a very interesting fact, that Ajaccio was the birthplace of Napoleon Bonaparte, and his home is open to tourists. I learned that we could not go there until one o'clock, so we walked through the streets. I visited the big Napoleon statue and the garden behind it. Ajaccio is a beautiful city in a lovely setting with many fine buildings. I inquired of an old gentleman on the streets for good restaurants, and he led us to the restaurant de Ajaccio. Then we visited Napoleon's home and bought some postcard views of both the interior and exterior. Several things of interest helped to pass the Sunday today. I woke at 8 o'clock to see a cloudy morning and turned over and went to sleep. When I woke again at 9 o'clock, the ground was covered with about 8 inches of snow, and it was falling blindingly, and it continued all day. There was a funeral this morning that brought me back to the play Our Town. The casket was hauled to the church in a little cart drawn by a very small donkey. After a short mass, it was borne on the shoulders of men to the cemetery on the mountainside. The priests walked ahead carrying a large black crucifix. There were no flowers, but the plain pine box was covered with the soft white snow before they had gone far. The villagers behind in their black clothing had walked beneath their big black umbrellas, a picture as solemn and silent as the falling snow itself. This afternoon, I played snowball with the kids, coasted down the hill on a homemade sled, and helped them make a snowman. They enjoyed pelting the American with snowballs and yelled, Cesse la guerre, when I got a particularly heavy bombardment. June 6, 1944, was the turning point of the war in the West. About 156,000 Allied forces landed on the 50-mile stretch of beaches in France's Normandy region. It has come, the invasion of France. Paratroopers dropping in behind the German coastal defenses in northern France during last night. Wave after wave of bombers busted the beaches in preparation for the landing, which took place at about 6 a.m. at various points from the Le Havre of Normandy. 4,000 to 6,000 have small bombs, and 11,000 planes are in the first day's operations. Losses, the commentators say, are far fewer than we expected. I have waited for this day for months, and as luck would have it, 15 minutes after the first announcement came over the radio, our power plant broke down. We were without current all day, and everyone has been on edge to know what is going on. The radio came on again tonight. Already troops have advanced as much as 10 miles inland, some farther. 7,000 air sorties were flown yesterday, and tons upon tons of all kinds of equipment have been brought in by boat, plane, gliders, and parachute. And this, I suppose, is the greatest invasion in the history of the world. American and Russian planes are said to have taken part in the big push. So far as we know, there has been no activity known on this side as yet. Several months later, in August of 1944, Kin traveled from Corsica to Maxime, France, on American LST 655. Christmas 1944 is just coming to an end. It has been a good day in some ways and an aggravating day in some ways. In the first place, we had to get up at 4.30 this morning to drive 40 miles to Dijon in the regimental service. It was very cold and everyone was griped to have to go so far at such an early hour. I sang Sastique de Noël and although I was pretty well frozen up from the long ride, I guess I did pretty well, at least everyone said so. This afternoon, we had a rifle inspection and some drill. That was the worst side of the day. Otherwise, it has been a good Christmas. I don't believe I've ever received so many presents. We have a tree in the main hall downstairs. The lights mother sent never arrived, but we made out, using a couple of regular bulbs covered with colored paper. 
we cut gift wrapping into ribbons to hang on the bows, along with a lot of small dolls that the boys won at the carnival shooting gallery at Lyon. In spite of the lack of material, the tree looks real good. Our big meal came tonight with turkey and the trimmings, and I am still too full. It was a huge meal. We couldn't have had a nicer, more colorful place to spend Christmas. If we had just the whole day to do just as we wanted, the day would have been as nearly perfect as possible away from home. I'm writing this in our room as I sit on the high back tapestry chair before the open fire. Christmas is over. I hope I spend the next one in front of our own fire back at McCutcheonville. On a particular day, while Ken McCutcheon was visiting the city of Ier, France, he took note of a spectacle that he saw on the city streets. I saw a most amazing sight that I have read about, but never expected to see. The whores who have entertained German soldiers paraded through the streets with their heads shaved bald. There were some 15 or 20 in the group I saw being marched at the point of guns. The citizens were making quite a sport of them, and one would have thought there was a circus in town from the excitement. The French seemed to have a mania for public humiliation as a form of punishment. On April 30th, 1945, News about Hitler and his wife Eva committing suicide reached Ken. Adolf Hitler is dead. It was announced at noon today. It is reported, that is, supposedly his death came to him in Berlin at midnight last night as a result of a stroke of paralysis after having been in poor health for some time. If true, this removes the great problem from the world. What to do with Hitler when the war is over? May 7, 1945, Germany surrendered which brought a long overdue end to the war in Europe. Tonight's broadcast says that a delegation of the German officials surrendered unconditionally to General Eisenhower this morning. Tomorrow is to be considered officially as Victory in Europe Day. It is to be a holiday in both England and Canada, as will Wednesday. The same will probably be true in the States, but we've heard no report as yet. Prime Minister Churchill will speak to the world at 3 p.m. tomorrow and the King at 9 p.m. Everything is extremely quiet here. I always expected that announcement of peace would bring a lot of excitement and wild celebrations. Quite on the contrary, everything is just as any other evening. Little groups cluster around the radio listening for late news. The question is heard repeatedly, well, how much longer do you suppose we'll have to stay over here? If anything, everyone seems more tired tonight than usual. Probably they just now begin to realize how tired of the war they are. August 10th, 1945. The second of two atomic bombs was dropped on Japanese colonies. All Paris newspapers are carrying streaming headlines tonight that Japan has capitulated. We had no official announcement from our government, so we don't know whether it is true or not. The second atomic bomb has been dropped on the city of Nagasaki, so it doesn't seem probable that Japan can or will last much longer. The reports of peace offer some reassurance from London. The Japanese government is supposed to send their proposal to Switzerland to be transmitted in turn to the four Axis powers. I am anxious to see the news in tomorrow morning's papers. By September 3, 1945, news of the end of the war in the Pacific had spread, and many were excited to get home. After the war, Ken McCutcheon returned to Vandenberg County and worked with veterans as a counselor. He went into radio broadcasting, joining WIKY as a radio host in 1947. For decades, Ken entertained and educated Evansville residents with several history books and numerous feature stories on historical topics that appeared in the Evansville Courier. He was probably most remembered for his book, The Adventures of Isaac Knight, Indian Captive. It told the story of a young Henderson, Kentucky boy that was captured by Native Americans in 1793. Upon retirement, Ken moved to a home near the University of Southern Indiana. When he died on August 6, 2002, he left many of his artifacts as well as his war journals to the University of Southern Indiana Special Collection Archives.